Hey guys, welcome back, Pastor Tony. Imagine April 1st, 33 AD. It's the calm before the storm. It's Holy Week, it's Wednesday. With Sunday's triumphal entry, and then all the drama of Monday and Tuesday, Monday, when Jesus cleanses the temple, and Tuesday, the temple controversies where Jesus is confronting the scribes and the Pharisees. But Wednesday, there's not a lot going on with Jesus and his disciples. But out of sight, lurking in the shadows, evil is stirring. The church has long called it Spy Wednesday as the dark day, the dark conspiracy against Jesus as it races forward. But not just from enemies outside, but now with a traitor from within. It is the day when the key pieces come together in the plot for the greatest sin in all history, the murder of the Son of God. Jesus and his disciples wake up. They're in Bethany with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. But just think. Listen. Caiaphas, he's the high priest then. He gathers into his like private residence all the chief priests, Sadducees, Pharisees, who already hated each other. But... To get rid of Jesus, they're going to be on the same team now, right? The chief priest, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the scribes, they want Jesus dead. But they couldn't kill him in the open. The people like him too much. And their public image was fragile enough as it was. Jesus had, had seen to that by cleansing the temple and then woeing them and calling them broods of vipers and all the parables that he said against them. And they're thinking, we're the good guys. But no. So Jesus is now in Jerusalem. It's Passover and it's in two days. And they're thinking, what should we do? We got two days. Enter the traitor, Judas. But we have to go back just a couple of days because it all started at the anointing in Bethany. Mary had taken a very expensive perfume and anointed Jesus with it because she believes. And Judas says, was this ointment not sold? We could have given to the poor. But Jesus doesn't share Judas's miserliness. He finds extravagance in the right place. He sees Mary's so-called waste as a worshiping impulse that goes beyond rational, calculated, efficient use of time and money. For Mary, Jesus is worth every shekel and more. And the anointed one, Christ himself, says what she has done is a beautiful thing. Spy Wednesday is a tragic reminder of 1 Timothy. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through the craving that some have wandered from the faith and have pierced themselves with many sorrows. But Spy Wednesday is also full of hope and grace. There's grace. Mary believes. Mary has believed the message that Jesus has been telling them all along. And Jesus wanted us to hear a message again and again. So Jesus rebukes Judas and he praises Mary and he says, Truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. And listen, listen, obviously, Judas's concern comes not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag of all the disciples, he used it for himself. 
The traitor had long been on the path of sin, having a hard heart. But the last straw is this extravagant anointing. So what happens? Satan finds a foothold in Judas's heart in the love of money and the wickedness that follows. Judas goes to the chief priest and he becomes just what they're looking for. The spy. The spy will lead them to Jesus the opportune time when the crowds aren't around and the greedy traitor did it for 30 pieces of silver. Which in Exodus 21, if you didn't know this, was the price for the life of a slave. And in today's money, it's only a few hundred dollars. Think about that. But Jesus knows every detail of what's happening, what's going to happen. And from the beginning of his public ministry, the disciples have been right by Jesus' side. They have learned from him. They have traveled with him. They have ministered with him. But now, listen, listen, but now, as Jesus' hour comes, the burden he must bear, he must bear it alone. The, the, the work, the definitive work, will be not a team effort. The anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ, must go forward alone. He's the only perfect one. And even his friends betray him, deny him, and then scatter like they're scared. One scholar said, and he's right, had the redemption of the whole world at that moment depended on the work and the diligence of the disciples, it would have never been accomplished. They couldn't even stay awake. Jesus is forsaken by his closest friends, his disciples. One of them is a spy against him. But even this is not the bottom of his anguish. The depth comes on the cross when he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But more remarkable than the depth of the forsakenness is the um, amazing love, the height of his love he will show. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Beloved, let me end. Let me end with this. We do not... A lot of us are nervous. Some of us are afraid of what's going on around in the world. Sometimes we don't even know how to pray. Remember this. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. And you know what? For those God foreknew, He predestined to become Conform to the image of his son, to be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. <laughs> what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those who God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died. And more than that, was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? 
shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or a sword or even a virus. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Beloved, remember that in hard times like this. And thank you 